Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday afternoon bull sessions. Uh, today's session is October 5th, 2021, and uh, we are focused in on Oktoberfest. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and I'm joined here by a couple of very special guests. Uh, Kim Butcher, say hello, Kim. Hi, guys. And Kim advises that the weather is behaving fairly well in Florida, and we're envious. And we're I'm also, just happy there's no hurricanes. <laughs> no hurricanes is a good thing. Knock okay. on wood. And then we have a second special guest here today, Sean Mace, who we're going to get to know a little bit better here in a few minutes. But welcome, Sean. Hello, everyone. I think you're joining us from near Hershey, Pennsylvania, if that uh, inspires anything in anybody out there, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty close to the, the home where chocolate matters. All right, so uh, today's theme is continuing down this path of Oktoberfest. You could call it Stocktoberfest, but Oktoberfest, as we continue to search for uh, candidates for study, for inclusion in our best small companies, for 2022, which we always do on Halloween. So much of uh, the next month will be spent uh, trying to discover the, the most promising opportunities in that realm. Hence the Red Bull uh, to go along with the Red Rabbits. You can see the rabbits are multiplying up at the top of the screen. And uh, see a little bit of Oktoberfest, and that, that is actually Sean and his Lederhosen um, down there in the lower banner. And uh, we'll spend some of our time here today with uh, the Fortune 100 fastest growing companies. The list is actually a year old, but the, the dashboard is, is still fully operational, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, of course, in honor of the great pumpkin, you have Snoopy there riding his doghouse. So let's go ahead and get underway. Just a reminder that no re investment recommendation is intended. This is all about education. We are demonstrating and uh, showing the methods and techniques, philosophies and analytical methods of the modern investment club movement as we've interpreted them here at Manifest Investing or as they are championed by the National Association of Investors now known as Better Investing. Uh, we will express opinions here today. Please do your own homework and conduct your own study of anything you think about investing in, especially in the realm of small companies. You want to double check your work and um, be extra careful um, but with that extra caution comes wonderful opportunity try to remember if we hold any in our personal portfolios and we'll let you know our monthly round table which has just been a blast here over the last few months um, comes up on the last tuesday of every month if you'd like to be added to an event reminder for that list if you're not familiar with it send me a question and i can send you uh, some more stuff but if you want to be added to the reminder Email nkavula1 at comcast.net. If you want copies of these slides or if you have follow-up questions or suggestions for other topics, send me an email, markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right. I wanted to take a moment just to introduce Sean. So good afternoon, Sean. Good afternoon, Mark. And I'm not going to read all of this other than he's, he's a whiz <laughs> kid in uh, information technology. That's what you need to know. And uh, uh, in fact, one of my favorite memories, we were actually in the Philadelphia, actually Harrisburg area, uh, trying to do a presentation with the local chapter. And we were having some hardware slash software difficulty. And uh, he stepped in and kind of bailed us out uh, as a member of the audience. Um, and I, I still remember that. And I'm still grateful, Sean. So, yeah, no, I've, it's it's always fun. I mean, that's definitely not as bad as trying to troubleshoot uh, a VC, you know VCR programming with your mom over the phone. <laughs> but uh... yep, and uh, and actually, we do have quite a, a background together. Uh, his father is one of my best friends, and was a member of our investment club in Chicago. Uh, his father, so uh, Sean, literally attended a few meetings. Uh, probably playing in the basement, as I recall, or playing in the backyard. Oh, yeah. No, it was always in the basement, and it was always hitting those uh, hitting the vents. There you with go. something and making a lot of noise for you guys. <laughs> but uh, 
I definitely graduated since then. Well, he's currently uh, continuing to work in the IT realm, but also pursuing a degree in finance and economics. And that's that's uh, the type of thing you need to know. And I also wanted to basically say thank you for your service. He you served in the Middle East. And uh, I remember one Saturday morning when you joined us, along with a few of your your colleagues there in the field from Kuwait. And uh, again, another chapter in uh, the history of manifest investing that we remember quite fondly. I didn't know you guys took it so uh, so great like that. It's, that's that's great. I'm glad you guys remember all that stuff. That was got we had about five people in that um, looking at your uh, the the tin cup portfolio. I remember talking about it all yeah. the time to them. All right. Did so you get we'll... any uh, people to convert, Sean? Um, actually, one of the people that um, attended that meeting is now a, a finance econom uh, economist at, um, I think, Salesforce. Woo! Good Excellent. job. All um, right. Yeah, he earned his degree after uh, serving there. So so welcome, Sean. And, and you'll probably see Sean working on a, a few things at Manifest Investing going forward. So now you can put a face to the, the voice or the correspondence that you may see. Quick reminder about what the session is all about. This is from a year ago, a little over a year ago. And again, it's uh, intended to be an informal, discursive group discussion. And uh, we try to keep it that way. All right, here's our bullpen. Again, just to remind that in the queue is a number of topics. Uh, we will be focusing a lot on the small companies, but we'll sprinkle in some other topics here this month. Again, if you want us to dig into something else, let us know. And uh, we'll do our best to try to come up with that. Well, we always like to start with a couple of graphs, and this one kind of intrigued me. Um, first, my reaction to this was to drive over to the local McDonald's to find out when the McRib is going to be available again. So, Sean, go ahead and... Oh, I... So, yeah. <laughs> this is just a, a chart that I thought was rather hysterical um, when it came to causation versus correlation. And... Uh, the person who, uh, uh, the author who published this, um, actually had some rather good points on on what to really look for when when looking for data. And just because you find something that correlates with it does not mean it's the cause of it. In this case, the McRib is usually released uh, around October uh, through January timeframe, which conveniently is also during the some of the best returns that the stock market will have all year. So ranging from what 0.82% up to almost one and a half percent in November on average. So I just thought it was a little interesting thing to make sure along your studies that if you see something that seems to correlate with it, just make sure you're looking back and saying, all right, what's the cause of what? And is there really any correlation between the two? So when I'm sitting at the drive through at McDonald's and the McRib is on the menu, I should also be uh, shopping for stocks. Absolutely. November 1st is when it comes back out. So. November 1st, yeah, that's what I discovered here also. And I don't know, do they sell McRibs in Florida, Kim? Not a McDonald's person, I, but that gives me an excuse to take mom through the drive through and get ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, and I do love the variety of graphs that are put out by these guys where there's a, uh, they basically do some interesting backfitting of data over time. All right, something a tiny bit more serious. I want to basically spend a moment with this chart. Uh, you guys, many of you have seen it before. It's basically a chart that we've used to, to track kind of the efficacy of uh, the type of investing that we do using the observation that value line is basically a lot like the modern investment club movement in how it looks at companies. It just uses a slightly different twist to the recipe including a, a bigger emphasis on cash flow than earnings. They don't ignore earnings, but they pay a little more attention to cash flow. And uh, I th what I thought I would do is break this chart down a little bit in, uh, into the pieces and basically say what I see with it. What this basically to me says, and it's not perfect, you know, very few things that are measured like this in life are perfect. But when it comes to doing stock studies and forecasting, again, think of, the, the stack of company reports in a value line investment survey, the standard edition, as a stack of stock studies or stock selection guides, because that's what it is. And what they do is they keep track of, you know, what those all add up to over time. 
And that's what's represented by the red bars. And literally the answer to the question, what did we say was gonna happen in the four years following that date? And then the green bullet points that you see on the chart are what commenced to actually happen. And uh, I don't know, uh, Sean, you're in the statistics class. Is that fairly decent correlation? I mean, uh, yeah, no, it, it it looks great. You obviously have some outliers there with uh, 2008, but I don't think anybody expected 2008 to happen. And then I imagine that's March of 2020 there with the next uh, big drop. Yeah, and the big red spike up there is the is obviously what happened <laughs> last March. But yeah, it's a. Uh, I think no, that looks they track pretty good. Good this correlation. So uh, there's there's kind of like a an excursion or a detour there every once in a while. And that's what the rule of five applies to. It's, it's a reminder that, uh, you know, 20% of the stock studies that you do, uh, there, there's nothing you could do. Um, it's like kryptonite. Uh, you could be Superman and you still wouldn't win. And uh, so t uh, there is an unpredictability. It's, it's all part of human nature or whatever. So I look at this and I see that they do t kind of tend to follow each other. By the way, if the next point on here is going to be a bit of a dip unless we have something unusual happen in the market because of where the market was four years ago in December 2017. And uh, so this is going to trend down unless something unusual happens. Um, so that's kind of the, the bottom line of the story. So now just put the put the stuff back in here so you can see this is the chart that's been published in the Wall Street Journal a few times. Uh, Mark Holbert and I talk about it from time to time. And uh, you see the actual numbers here now. The most recent result just happened a couple of days ago. The prediction back in September 2017 would have been 7.8%. And you can see we're in one of those kind of excursion moments now where we actually came in a little better than expected four years ago. Um, it, we're just in kind of one of those little moments. And who can blame uh, the forecasters for the pandemic? So... That's what it really does boil down to. The other thing that Ken Kavula really likes to point out is those those green dots, they zig and they zag over the years. But if you draw an average down the middle of them all, it's 10 to 11 percent, specifically 10.6 percent in this case. So uh, we do think that the type of stock studies done by the Modern Investment Club movement uh, can be quite informative and quite helpful. And it's certainly our experience in general in the community. Um, so we do like to visit that and keep track of that uh, as a, a way of keeping score of the efficacy over time. All right, let's go ahead and switch to, uh, one last graph because it's really the important one for the day. Since Ken is on the roads of West Virginia, I can talk a little bit more about this without him giving me the shh quiet mark because he thinks we jinx ourselves every time we talk about it and we probably do. But as we Halloween approaches, Halloween is the end date coming up here in 20, what is it, 27 days. Uh, a lot can happen in 27 days. It certainly did last year. But you can see that we have pulled, uh, we actually are at 45 and change for the selection of stocks that we did a year ago in Halloween versus the Wilshire 5000 since Halloween, checking in at about 35. So during a September, which was pretty ugly, and it seen, and that blue bar was actually catching up to the red bar during September. Uh, we've had a pretty good close to September and uh, look forward to hopefully having our seventh straight win. Um, it adds up to a pretty superlative in performance. And we really do believe in uh, the realm of opportunity that's available in these best small companies. It's one of the reasons we obsess about on it this time of year and uh, look forward to the Halloween celebration again this year. Any comments or questions, Kim, at this point? No, I just think small caps, we can really make money. We just have to be diligent to find quality with it. Yep, and, that, that's, and you just made Ken smile if he were listening. Uh, that is his main thing. He says you don't have to compromise, and uh, you don't have to compromise quality when it comes to investing in these smaller companies. So here's what we're doing. We are out there trying to find the red rabbits. That's our, our moniker for, uh, or our, I guess our mascot for this effort that goes on every year. We have already checked in with the Forbes list, uh, the standing screen at Better Investing, 
a couple others, Y charts, a little bit of the Hoover's Handbook of Emerging Companies. And we're going to continue to uh, trudge through some of these. And we're actually going to add a couple here, uh, mostly as inspired by, by Sean here. Oh, by the way, this is a couple weeks old. Just This just shows you we're now 10 percentage points ahead. And you can see that it was actually closing to less than 5% uh, a couple of weeks ago. So the lead has actually uh, improved. So that's the opposite of jinxing ourselves, I guess. So then we're, this is what we're going to cover here during the next month. And here's the way you want, kind of want to think of it. Um, King of the Hill uh, during Oktoberfest 2021. And uh, we're searching for approximately 20 plus or minus the best small companies uh, with the three things on the right really mattering. Uh, growth. We want double digit growth out of the companies that we add to the list. Quality. No need to compromise when uh, discovering small company opportunities, as Kim just said. And again, it's not just a matter of finding companies that are growing, but companies that actually have room for price appreciation and uh, total return. So we do obviously include that in what we're trying to do here. Some of those other lists don't pay much attention to uh, returns, and it, it shows. Um, and then I just love I, I love some of the 1950s or 1940s ads and uh, tabletop game boxes. Those kids are uh, a little less frightening than some of the kids that you see on cereal boxes and et cetera. But uh, anybody happen to own that game? <laughs> no. No. All right. Here's a look at our best small companies. As of right now, these again are just nominees, so approximately the top 20. And uh, we're not going to go into them in any great detail. I do uh, regret um, Southern Missouri has act, Bancorp has actually jumped the gun and gone up 22 or 23 percent since we added it to the list. So they're actually in danger of falling off the list because they've gotten kind of hot in the last month. So yeah, that's a, a pretty big deal. But you can see a number of the companies that have been uh, regularly featured at uh, round tables and uh, these type of sessions over the last month or so. Mercury Systems is on here. We just uh, took a time out on that one in the round table the tracking portfolio, but uh, pretty good spread of companies. Anything jump off this page at you, Sean? Uh, the iRobot, actually, uh, we had to deal with their customer service and they were just superb. Um, they have been an absolute amazing um, company to deal with when it came to their uh, their products. We actually have the robot that does all the vacuuming automatically and then it has the tower it goes to and sucks up all the dirt. So you don't have to keep uh, replacing the, the the vacuum bags or anything like that. It's an, it's an amazing product and I absolutely love it. And it's very easy to deal with. So definitely has a, a, some good potential there. Yeah, the only problem that uh, we might be facing with them is, again, kind of a little bit of a saturated market. Uh, they are trying to upsell and and upgrade, you know, their existing customer base, which is very loyal, by the way. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the stock price has come back a bit. It was uh, significantly overvalued at one point. Now it's uh, maybe a slightly overvalued still. It'll be interesting to see if that one continues to survive. We had a debate on Metafast here uh, a couple weeks ago or last week, I don't recall. But a uh, number of good companies on there. Um, uh, Kim, I might uh, get you to rate Green Tree Hospitality over the coals here in the next couple of weeks. Okay. You're excellent. Um, I, I can tell you that Southern Missouri Bank Corp just bought a uh, privately held bank, and that's probably why it's popped up so much. Okay. So that's the catalyst. Yeah. And I think it's pulled back a little already. Yeah, it was, like 43. yeah, it was up above, uh, well, the value, since we added to the list, was up to over 23%. It's down a little bit from where it was. Mm -hmm. All right, good stuff. So that's that. those are the ones on top of the hill. In, in this game of King of the Hill, we are basically looking for companies to challenge these. Um, so the first place we wanted to spend some time with here today, and I really regret that Ken's missing this one because this is right up his alley. Um, the Fortune 100, I think this first came to us via Marie Frank a few years, years ago. She noticed that they had been doing this list for some time, and it's a quite interesting list, for, and a, a number of things kind of jump out here. 
Uh, first of all, just this notion of not just small companies, but kind of the way we think of everything, faster growing, fastest growing. So we like small companies, but we also really are using the growth of the company as the ultimate benchmark for whether it's small, medium, or large. So the fact that Fortune is uh, willing to go with the, the fastest growing companies is pretty cool. The other thing that kind of jumps out is we weren't the only ones to benefit from finance companies in our list for the current year. Uh, these guys a year ago uh, had a number of finance companies in their banks and insurance companies. And uh, I think they exclude REITs and a couple other things, but they do allow finan financial sector companies to come in. And uh, that has served them well. We'll take a look at how well here in a minute. But notice number 10 on the list down there, certainly not a small company, but one that is, is growing pretty well. This list is a fantastic list. You do have to subscribe to Fortune to actually look at it um, and, and dig into the features, but uh, it, it's, it's a pretty impressive list of 100 companies from where I sit. You can see that the, the criteria is all laid out right here. And, uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to share with you guys is you notice the date up there in the upper left came out right before Halloween last year. So we'll be watching very carefully to see if there's any last minute entries or companies that we should consider for our list. But that won't leave us a whole lot of punch and crunch time come Halloween. Between now and then, we'll probably run that same type of uh, screen that you see spelled out um, there in, in the verbiage. Uh, using the the Y charts as a as a resource. Okay, here's a look at the top performing companies, and you may remember the Forbes list uh, a few weeks ago. We talked about um, had checked in at about 22 or 24 percent over the last year. You can see that this list of 100 companies is checking in at a market beating 40.7 percent. Here's the top 25 companies. Uh, so you can see what the price was last Halloween, and uh, actually I started it on 9.29, or maybe that should be 10.29 up here. I'll check that, but it won't won't be dramatically different. Um, pretty good, pretty good collection of companies. The ones bolded are banks, and just look at some of those numbers. So I mean, they obviously benefited from being willing to have some uh, promising looking banks in the mix. Any thoughts here, Kim or Sean? So I actually, I'm, I'm trying to think here with, uh, uh, I mean, mortgages have been going through the roof as far as what banks have been able to get a hold of. My only concern is, is with interest rates being so low, my interest rate for my mortgage after I refinanced it was uh, a 1.95%, 30 year mortgage. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if inflation continues the way it is, how are they going to make money off of that? As inflation goes up, that money becomes worth less and less. So, yeah, it's been doing great for them right now. But if inflation is not transitory, transitory, then it might hurt them in the long run. That's a lot of banks that we have there. Yeah, and it it certainly certainly is a challenge for banks if the economy is pushed over the tipping point. Um, you know, one of the benefits that the the banks have had is they've been getting fairly low cost money out the window, through, you know, from the Fed and, you know, their spreads are, you know, last time I checked, there's no money to be made in the savings account. Um, oh. So they've actually done fairly well on the spreads and they can ratchet them up uh, fairly carefully. But obviously if the economy starts uh, going haywire, it, it, it will get ugly for the banks. Yeah. Yeah. I was just concerned about with the inflation. That, that, that was my main thing because mm -hmm. previous loans then become worth less and less yep. over time. I thought though that what Ross had always said is as the interest rates go up, then banks are able to have a larger spread on what they take in and what they can charge the other next customer. And they'll yeah. know because of what they've had to go through since 08 and 09 to make sure they have better quality loans. Because people will always have to have a loan sometime. Correct. It, it's just the it's a short term. It's a, it's those the long term loans that are that fall below the in, that uh, I'm sorry that fall below the inflation rate. 
that uh, they'll start losing money on. That, that's the only that's the only thing. It's just old loans. The new loans, yeah, they'll be able to make more more money on. But um, those old loans, I mean, how, we'd have to look back at how many loans they, they've given out this year and last year that all are all below interest or inflation rate right mm-hmm. now. Yeah, it's a fairly carefully managed spread that they have, and they they especially the ones that show up at the top of uh, the screen that we did a few weeks ago. Many of those companies actually are in that. We're in that screen. So yeah. again, from top to bottom on here, you can see some some really interesting companies. Look at Gartner up at the top, Sean. Ticker symbol IT. Yeah, no, that's that has been insane watching that thing grow since two thousand and nine. It's just they've just been steady. Yeah. So I, I I would keep with them. <laughs> yep. Interesting consulting firm there, engineering and construction, MYR Group, about the fifth one down. And again, Generac, we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, I think. EPAM Systems has just been going nuts for many of our portfolios, including the, the roundtable tracking portfolio. Um, yeah, so I'm sure Cy si is happy with that one because he was always presenting it. Yep. Yep. That whole area is uh, very popular with Cy. Si. So anyhow, they've done very well. Um, the companies are actually committed at least temporarily until Fortune tells me to take it down um, to a dashboard. So you can actually access that public dashboard down at the, the bottom there with this link that you see. And uh, what this is, is basically taking that dashboard and sorting it by quality. So we're, what we're looking at here is the highest quality companies and we're literally going down the list and just eyeballing, you know, where are the companies that have uh, outsized or superior return forecasts? And you see Malibu Boats, which has been at, featured a number of times. It's on the current best small company list. It's also been featured at the, the conference by Charlene Hansen and picked by Ken for the, the roundtable a couple of times. So now it can take off and go up. Uh, it has, actually has been improving here lately. Uh, the other one that jumps out is Ollie's Bargain. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Jumps off the page. Go ahead, Kim. CoStar jumps off at me, and I can't. I'm trying to place why it does. Is that uh, gaming? No, I don't think it's gaming. I'm not sure. I think it's more. Uh, well, somebody in the audience will tell us. Mm-hmm. I, sh- I should know the answer to that. Um, oh, I see my PayPal there. <laughs> yep, PayPal makes the list uh, along with Facebook, Alibaba. I mean, it's in red because it's a Chinese company. We beat up on them last week, perhaps unfairly. Time will tell. Universal Display is a community favorite going back over the years. It's also a candidate again with the pullback in price that it's had. Um, they make the the flat panel, a lot of the equipment for the flat panel displays for computer screens and TVs. Um, EPAM shows up here also. Uh, Intuitive Surgical, if you want uh, an excellent dissertation on Intuitive, uh, we're gonna have to fix the stock price here, I believe, Len Douglas following the stock split that I believe is happening today at Intuitive Surgical. And uh, Sean and I were chatting in the green room about Trex. Trex making this list, I love the company. I think I first brought it to the stock to study at Better Investing probably 15 years ago. Well, more than that, probably 20 years ago now. And uh, they, of course, make the wood for home and residential construction, that uh, replacement wood, not wood, that is usually more expensive but got, actually got cheaper there for a while. Uh, that's what everybody here in Fort Lauderdale likes to do to have um, their outside patio furniture especially when you're near the ocean because the salt water doesn't erode it at all sure all right and the only other one that really i think this one is a good study for clubs and all around generac uh, home generators for at home your own residential generator and uh good study and it's actually now at a fairly decent return okay same dashboard only in this case shorting sorting by highest uh, projected annual return and descending. And here, of course, you'd be looking for the ones with high rates of return forecasts that uh, also have fairly decent quality ratings. So some of the same companies are obviously going to 
fall off the list and a few other ones get added along the way. Greenbrick is already uh, on the candidate list. Um, Alibaba, of course, the Chinese, but Mercury makes it. That's on the candidate list already. Malibu again. And uh, Essent is one that Ken has been talking about. That's a mortgage insurance type company. So it's a, it's a good list to kind of kick around. Um, I am kind of fascinated by the overall performance and the overall distribution uh, as a source of companies to go for, especially these are mostly going to qualify as pretty much core holdings, potential core holdings for the most part, uh, with a few exceptions. So should be fun. So let's talk a little bit about Ollie's. I know Ollie's has been uh, kind of a mini community favorite. I know it's been added to a number of club portfolios in the last year or so. The price has been punished by the pandemic, uh, but operating performance has not. Now, I don't know if they have any special wrinkle with respect to inventory management and avoiding some of the, the stuff that you're reading about now in the newspaper every day with the supply chain disruptions. But uh, the current outlook, almost a $2 billion company growing at 12%, that's the slope of the red line, with uh, a net margins in that 10% range, and that's certainly credible based on what we're looking at here, and uh, a PE in the upper 20s, perhaps 30-ish. So even if you pick 25, you're talking about pretty decent return characteristics, pretty decent projected return on value. It's a worthy study, and uh, a current relative strength index down closer to 20. So it's a it's a pretty good study and it's it's going to penetrate our list for consideration for halloween now uh i'm i can't remember how many states are these guys in sean it's a geographic expansion uh, uh, possibility too. yeah it's 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 mostly out, out in the northeast only but uh i mean they're definitely here in pennsylvania where i'm at and uh, they've been just popping up all over the place advertisements has been uh, they've just been explore, exploding up in, uh, in advertisement as well because now you can't go without seeing one or two billboards without them on your drive. It's been crazy. They're definitely a, a contender for a small company becoming really big so and really you, quick. Have you done any personal field research yet? Actually, so um, oops, sorry here. Right, so actually, uh, we actually bought some of our vacuums from them. Okay. Um, and they they operate by actually talking to working out with other wholesalers that just need to get rid of inventory and so they they buy their products at a steep discount and they give out the products at, at a at an even steeper discount than their competitors i mean it is it's their business model is definitely something different than what the rest of the industry is doing and uh, i sincerely uh, uh could see them being a good competitor for for future um, as they expand from out in the northeast to elsewhere yeah, those are pretty healthy profit margins. You know, when you compare a Costco at approximately 2%, Walmart at 3 maybe 4%, um, pretty pretty interesting. But interesting to see exactly what produces that uh, level and if it's uh, something that can continue to plateau at that level going forward. But, yeah, it's a geographic expansion possibility, too. Yeah, exactly that. Right now they're operating as a, as a smaller business type, so they don't have all the larger business expenses. But I definitely, with that profit margin, they got room to grow. Yeah. Kim, are they in Florida? I have not seen them at all. I guess I need to do a little bit more homework myself. On, I know they're in 20, between 20 and 25 states and with room to grow. All right. The other list, which kind of surprised Sean and I as we were kicking around a little bit, was the Financial Times out of... Uh, Great Britain. And uh, you can actually reach the link. We've actually captured the top 20, but you know, we've gone through the, the first 60 or 80 and just looking for obvious candidates for a quicker look. But that link will actually take you to their list of, uh, I think there's 300 there. If yeah, there's quite a bit. You know, there's quite a few companies there. Now, I mean, I take a look at the list and I, I do focus in on uh, the revenue column, the 2019 revenues, and I'm looking for you know, a little more substance in terms of numbers. Now, Sean, you actually kicked around a few more of these than, than I did. What was your general perceptions? So, yeah, out of the 20 here, I've only found two that were actually being uh, actively traded. One, the Good Foods out in Canada and uh, Smile Direct Club. 
So those were some definitely interesting candidates. Yeah, good food for those who don't know are basically uh, it's it's the equivalent to Blue Kitchen um, out here in the states. So they just deliver meals that you have to um, that are prepped, but you still have to cook them. So it's yeah. uh, it's definitely a good worth looking at. I don't know if it has a, an ADR yet. It probably will if it continues. But the the ticker symbol is food, F O O D dot T O for good food and it is out there it does not have earnings yet but it's it's getting close getting close to having some earnings so it's a very promising revenue profile and it's kind of the, one of those uh, uh we we refer to them as broad assets or launch pad opportunities where they're just breaking through to profitability so uh again it can be a minefield but uh, it can also be a tremendous opportunity for early stage investing now, Smile Direct Club, we actually put together a chart on. That one's been around for a little bit more. And you can see that there's a little more information. They're still not profitable, which means we're still looking at negative net margins, but uh, the trend is certainly in the right direction. Again, launch pad, early stage type investing, but um, they're building quite a business. Um, they're up to almost $2 billion in sales. And... Uh, it's it's a, a pretty competitive playing field here. Your thoughts on this one, Sean? Um, yeah. So, F, F, oh my gosh. So my wife actually used uh, Smile Direct, and the, you don't unlike the other companies where you actually have to go to a dentist. You don't have to go to a dentist with Smile Direct. They actually deliver the um, this this foam or um, almost like a putty type that you have to push in your mouth to get a uh, an impression of your teeth. But you do it all from home. So uh, th with between their customer service and emailing and their immediate response times, I mean, they're a they're definitely an off the radar company because looking at uh, some of the recommendations for um, from other uh, analysts, it's either avoid or neutral on it. Like they don't have an opinion one way or the other. And so this definitely will is seems to be flying under the radar for a lot more. And also as an expanding company or as a company that's just starting out, their goal is, is kind of actually to lose money initially because it saves them taxes later on when they actually do start making money. So I definitely think this is a good contender for a, a growing company. Yeah, it's it's another one of these early stage. If they actually do uh, do what is shown here on the picture, they will become profitable in the next couple of years. Obviously, that has tax benefits. Uh, taking all of that out of it, as we often do with our projected return on value, um, you're basically talking about a 12% situation. That's a superior projected return on value, which again, just to remind everybody, is uh, pre-tax income divided by the enterprise value of the company, and a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit of an interest rate here, a little bit high, uh, signifying a little bit, but uh, again, pretty, pretty good. Uh, opportunity and it is covered in the value line standard edition so you can follow along on this again early stage kind of a, a launching pad situation much like uh, the broad assets investment club kind of made famous here at manifest in the groundhog contest when they won several years using that same type of thing for a portion of their uh, groundhog selections so good clean fun good to yeah, follow Mark, we have a few questions in the question box sure Saying that um, Oli uh, are in Florida because they're in Sarasota, according to Nikki. Uh -huh. But she was wondering if anyone know why they had dropped so much this year. And someone answered that they may be getting squeezed because those retailers are short of inventory, like TJ Maxx and those because they buy all buy surplus inventories. And with the shipping issue, there may be a supply chain issue. Could be. I mean, if you just look at the price chart, they were actually up, you know, after the IPO up in the $20 range, they're now back at five. So like Sean was saying, I think they're probably getting beat to a pulp by, you know, the perception of the rhinos. Um, I don't know about the specific operating challenges uh, and what they might be immune to compared to uh, an aligned technology, for example, which I believe is fully... Uh, uh, cooperating with dentists, I think their aligned technology is actually done by dentists. If I if I'm right about that, were you talking about Ollie? Um... 
no, talk or are we about, talking about the smile? Align, tech, Align Technology has been kind of a community favorite oh, for some time. Ticker symbol ALGN, they would be a direct competitor, I think. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, they actually, their technology actually was uh, is a part of another slide here, Mark. But uh, um, they are, you have to go see a de dentist. And the problem is, my wife is actually using them right now instead of uh, Smile Direct. Mm -hmm. um, but um, because you have to go see a dentist, there's co pays involved with it, um, insurance gets involved with it a little bit. So you, it's it's it can be a bit more uh, messy to to handle. So that's why I have a feeling Smile Direct has that that slight advantage um, over um, uh, Ally, Ally or Align or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and you know again, I don't have the answer to the question other than to point out that anytime a company uh, you know comes out and has a moment like this, which was probably pandemic related, but this downdraft in uh, actual sales results which they're obviously projected to, uh, you know, basically launch from there. But that downdraft is enough to cause this downdraft in price. Because, the, well, you know, yeah, the, the it, was, the yeah, it was 81. Now it's 59. Yep. And then Len said he thought a uh, Smile Direct Club bought product from a line. That'd be interesting. Could be. It's there for us to follow along, though, in the, as the saga unfolds. We smile. All right, so here's the companies on the list as of right now, kind of the top 20 shown on the, above the red line and some of the challengers or people that have been booted. So basically what it comes down to, in order to make the list, and we've left Metafast and MI, NMI Holdings, which is a property and casualty insurance company, on there just because as we fine tune it, it could actually come in at double digits, but um, unless unless we get a peremptory uh, challenger placement on the jury, um, those two would actually be in trouble. We're also not gonna have four or five regional banks as part of our best small companies. So some of those will be challenged, but as of right now, you pretty much have to have a double digit projected return on value and uh, a manifest rank uh, greater than 98. So double digit growth greater than 98 on the manifest rank in order to, to rank in the top 20. And some of those will be subjected to some fairly substantial challenges here in days ahead. And we'll continue to try to find opportunities that, to challenge the Kings of the Hill on the charts. All right. All right, here's an example. Sean and I exchange uh, some interesting notes from time to time. And uh, again, we don't want to be uh, nasty about it, but Kathy did have a fairly interesting observation here a few days ago, and it's a little bit uh, provoking because uh, there's an awful lot of people blaming chip, chip shortages for uh, their operating results. And obviously the cars are stacking up around here in parking lots. And this is an example of something where you, you want to dig in a little bit deeper. Um, as Ken has talked about a, a few times over, when they're blaming the weather or one extra shopping day in the quarter or that kind of stuff, you know, in their quarterly conference calls, you just want to kind of, hmm, uh, over the situation. So Sean actually shared, shared, the, shared this the other day. And uh, would you like to expand on this at all? Oh, I, I just, I think it's amazing that you can have uh, Tesla being, since it's a rather semi-small company, that it can be as nimble as it is. I mean, as you can see there, they worked around the chip shortage and actually had to change their um, their software and or to rewrite their software and found alternative chips that will work with their um, uh, with their vehicles. Meanwhile, GM or Toyota or whoever, they're just they just didn't adjust. They just kept to what they were stuck with um, and, didn't, and didn't change their supply um, chains as, as needed. So I definitely think Tesla being able to move um, uh, with the agility they're moving, it definitely gives them a, a lot of room to run um, um, from here on. And from here on. Um, yeah, and I guess the only observation I would have is obviously the other guys are dealing with a bigger uh, volume of chips, you know, even though there's less per vehicle, but uh, 
it is it is fascinating and, and to those of us that are uh, directly connected to the the big three or the auto industry uh, a little bit annoying that because uh, I actually know people that are involved in this area and uh, it, it really is kind of fascinating and uh, troubling that Tesla basically was out in front of this and reprogramming chips that were intended for other uses in order to avoid uh, the supply chain disruption. Just uh, just an interesting type of uh, comment made by somebody like Kathy and uh, kind of kind of fun to follow along. Uh, just a reminder that you can go to, uh, you can search in the search uh, function at manifest and go back and look at some of the stuff we just, disc we just disc discussed uh, Tesla about a year ago and Hugh McManus and I walked through and described uh, in a little different perspective, you can see that Mr. Musk there is smoking hot. Um, there in the middle of the page. And there's the actual cover from a little bit over a year ago. One of the things that we like to point out, and I wanted to, to use this slide as a, as a demonstration of why we spend so much time thinking about projected return on value. Because when you're dealing with an early stage company, and we, talk, we covered this a year ago, uh, you can go back and look at early stage Amazon. You can look at early stage Tesla. And uh, just like the third slide said, Sean likes to tease me about his interest in Tesla back when it was $40 a share. I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still uh, bruised and damaged from those days, Sean. Love it. It's a Tesla. I just, you, you, I just saw it. You had, you had a, another almost arguably a Steve jobs, um, uh, type of a, a personality back in the day. And I, I just saw it. I, I, I honestly, it was all luck, but I don't have to be right all the time. I just have to be right some of the time. Right. Yep. So in this case, this is just a reminder. You can go back and get more on the details here, but when you're dealing with an early stage company, uh, sort of like that um, smile direct that we were talking about a few few minutes ago and you don't have earnings uh, so you can't do a traditional analysis and Nicholson taught that you could convert or switch to cash flow which is what value line does anyhow and the other interesting thing is that uh, again without earnings you don't have PEs a lot of times you hear PEs as an excuse for not even uh, having any interest in these type of companies and that's sort of what we took on last year uh, the projected return on value does not involve PE ratios at all. So it actually is an opportunity, and it's one of the reasons that on this chart, we actually pay attention to this column because many of the companies that are over here are going to be early stage or tipping point or launch pad type opportunities. And the, it's really the only uh, fairly reliable way that you can uh, – can tackle some of them. So again, that's your reminder. Go back and check if you'd like to look. I think I need to up, update this slide and put another another year of uh, data progression on it. That'll be kind of fun. Yeah, no, Tesla has been an absolute amazing thing, and it leads right into this um, with uh, with Tesla. Everyone thinking of Tesla as a car company. It started out as a car company in two thousand eight, but uh, <laughs> they are definitely becoming more than a car company. And they're becoming more of a, uh, of a of a research and development company. And I want to point out, they're, um, Elon Musk, who also owns SpaceX here, um, the, the potential for technology um, that just is not available here on Earth, the, the potential for SpaceX to develop technology that can then become a direct, directly flow into, uh, into Tesla's uh, um, line of cars is, is huge. Um, I was talking to Mark earlier about it, and NASA is actually what comes to mind. There are so much um, benefits that NASA provided to the um, uh, to the commercial side of things uh, that helped a lot of companies take off. Um, we were actually just talking about um, Smile Direct and uh, um, uh, Ally. Um, yeah, Align. They they're, um, the technology for that actually came from NASA. And since NASA's um, started to share its technology with the commercial industries, um, they actually have over, I think it was 20,000, oh, I'm sorry, the program has documented over 2,000 technologies over time and since uh, 1979, I believe. So there's a lot of potential here that if, if SpaceX is exploring um, 
things or problems that they have, you don't know what they could come up with and things that would actually be viable for, for commercial use. Um, the, the LASIK that we currently, uh, many, many enjoy right now, was actually originally used for, um, for docking purposes out in, uh, in space. Teflon, Bowflex, solar cells, GPS, that was an entire industry um, uh, of, of satellites from NASA and, and the military. So all that created a lot of commercial potential. And I think with SpaceX having that, um, uh, that technology that's available to them, uh, they can bring that technology right into their cars. And that will 100% beat out anything that GM or Toyota or um, Ford can come out here, can come up with here on Earth. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. Yep, and then they obviously have to be tracking that. It, it doesn't even have to be that sophisticated. I, lo I look back to the emergence of tang as a drink uh, from powder that was yes. uh, out of the space program but i, I will tell you the thing that kind of got me with uh spacex and and the musk adventure um the first time i watched one of those booster rockets land on a barge uh you know come mm -hmm. back and actually land it uh they're doing something uh completely out of the realm if you've not ever witnessed that uh, you can youtube it and you know, watch one of these things come back after it's delivered its payload to space and literally just land on a barge in the, the middle of a pond. And uh -huh. uh, it's just, just uh, wow. It's a wow thing. But that, that also leads into uh, software technology, too. I mean, to be able to do all that and do the computations for that, mm -hmm. that's a type of software that many, many commercial industries, I'm sure, would love to have. Um, including, let's look at Lockheed Martin, I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, as a military defense. If you can coordinate where things are going to be going ahead of time, and it might be more efficient to do it that way than their current technology, then you have uh, a potential to be able to sell those products commercially. And a lot of that could be done through Tesla. Um, I also want to point out Tesla, you, you mentioned Generac, Mark, and which is a home uh, generator for your house, but Tesla's already in that business with their Powerwall. Uh, mm -hmm. If I was looking at a power wall, it would cost me the equivalent of what Generax would charge me uh, between, I think, 7000 to 15000 but it's all through electricity. So I don't have to have a natural gas line to be able to run my house or, 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 uh, or fill it up as a, um, with, with a fuel. It could just works off electricity for three days. So they yeah. are competing in so many areas, and Tesla is no longer just a car company. We might want to actually take a look at the economics of your situation there, Sean, just to illustrate at a future session that uh, the shingles is what he's talking about. Shingles for his roof becoming yes. a source of electricity. So neat stuff. All right. oh, yeah. Don't they, don't they also have solar power? Oh, they do. Store? Yeah, the, sing, the, sh the shingles look just like normal conventional shingles or tiles, and uh, but they generate electricity. Good stuff. Yep. So what we're looking forward to doing is spending a little bit more time with social media. So hopefully we'll have Sean back and take a look at some of these other somewhat conventional sources of ideas and uh, probably add that to the list. But that's part of the coverage for the, the rest of the month to dig into some of these other reliable sources. Uh, including ARC Investments and tech, Kathy up at the top there. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. All right. Here's just a quick reminder that we do uh, archive these sessions on YouTube under Manifest Investing. So the bull sessions, the expected returns reviews, which we have another session tonight that we had to reschedule from Saturday morning. So we'll be doing that along with all the roundtables. And then you can see the, the conference there that uh, – where we shared a bunch of ideas last May, and preceded by sessions in November and the previous May. So uh, again, go to the, the page and we'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. If you subscribe, you're basically notified anytime that more content is shared. Just a quick reminder that uh, with the cancellation of the Better Investing National Convention, um, we regret that, but it, it, it does create uh, our Nicknamed conference, the COVID cancellation conference number four. We had hoped to be back in person and hope that that will happen soon, but this will be our fourth COVID cancellation session, also known as Successful Investing Four. And we've got putting together a, a series of webcasts. There will be two, two webcasts on the 10th and two on the 11th, including a panel, a stock selection panel on the 11th. Oh, yeah. 
two, two on Wednesday, two on Thursday, but one is in the evening. So you have one during the day on Thursday and one in the evening? I believe so. Okay. That's the that's the hope, and we were hoping that uh, that might help you out a bit, Kim. Oh, yeah. So we'll do what we can. Here's a quick look at the, the groundhog. Um, uh, the groundhog participants have been crushed here over the last week. There's no two ways about it. This number was about 6% a couple weeks ago, and uh, the average result is now just 1%. Uh, this is the lowest number in the history of the contest, so we hope that between now and February 2nd, things improve. You're not alone. Kathy is back to 140th. She had gotten as high as 130th. So you can see where the carnage is happening. And uh, Sean, it's your opportunity to take a bow. Oh, Kim, you, you'll like this. The only thing holding me back is uh, is Palantar, <laughs> Palantir Technologies. They're holding me back. Well... But uh, the All thing right. is, is um, I guess you could say the same thing with Ardelix because the uh, the FDA is holding us back. We're going to have to give it time before they decide they want to pass it. That's right. And, <laughs> and Hugh gave us some hope at the last round table that uh, that there's hope for Ardelix. So let's let's continue to hope for the best. The only thing I want to add here is I really hope uh, Kathy uh, Kathy Wood has uh, has bought the dip because ouch. Yeah, she's uh, she's having a, a tough few months. We're going to talk about that tonight a little bit. And we'll close with this slide from Lake Superior that happens to be paint, or pictured rocks up in uh, Lake Superior. And a quick blessing from Vin Scully, which also aligns pretty well with the opening of the, the baseball playoff season. I, of course, will be tuned in with uh, eyeballs on the tube tomorrow night as the Cardinals begin their quest for a world championship. But we'll just leave it with that. Any closing thoughts, Sean or Kim? I Look forward to the session later today. Yeah, and I think what Vin has there is absolutely perfect. Yeah, I like to pull that out every October and uh, share it with a Facebook audience, but I thought I'd share it here today. And for those of you that don't know, Vin was the, Mr. Scully, was the voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers for probably the better part of 40 or 50 years on the radio and TV for uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks for checking in, Kim. I hope things are well down there. Oh. And uh, everybody get out there and hunt down some good small company opportunities and let us know about them. Thanks, everybody. All right. Goodbye, guys. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.